Good morning. Uh, my name is Leah Brosgal. I'm a professor at UCLA, in, a professor of French and Francophone studies at UCLA in the Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies. I'm very happy to be here today uh, on behalf of the UCLA Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies. Um, I am happy to welcome you to today's event, which highlights Professor Samuel J. Spinner and his recent work titled Jewish Primitivism. Which you can see here. Uh, Professor Spinner is, uh, a, is affiliated with the Johns Hopkins University, his institutional home. This event is part of the Michael and Irene Ross Lecture in Yiddish Studies, and everybody should know that Professor Spinner's book is available through Stanford University Press and wherever books are sold, including Amazon.com. We'd like to thank you for staying socially distant and intellectually engaged by joining us for these virtual events. So before we, we dig into our topic of discussion today, which is again, Jewish primitivism, let me first introduce Professor Spinner and my co-panelist, Benjamin Kirsten. Samuel Spinner is the Zelda and Meyer Tedentnik Assistant Professor of Yiddish Language, Culture and Literature at Johns Hopkins University. His book, Jewish Primitivism on Primitivism in Modern Jewish Literature, Photography and Graphic Art was published in July in 2021 of last year by Stanford University Press. He is currently researching a book tentatively titled Monuments of Books on the Aesthetics of Monumentality in Holocaust Museums and Literature. His work has appeared in PMLA, MLN, Proof Texts, and German Quarterly. Spinner is co-editor of the review German Jewish Cultures, a book series published by Indiana University Press, and serves in, as an editor of the Yiddish Studies Journal, Ingebeb. Joining us also is Benjamin Kirsten, doctoral student at the, University, at the UCLA Department of Art History. Uh, Benjamin received a BA in art history from Pomona College and an MA in visual studies from the State University of New York at Buffalo. His research focuses on the visual art of Yiddish culture, spanning objects of the earliest 20th century that were produced and circulated within Yiddish networks and uses of Yiddish by contemporary artists. So an ideal interlocutor for uh, Sam's work on Jewish primitivism. So we're very excited to discuss Sam's new book, Jewish Primitivism. And Sam, before we dive more deeply into the book itself, which we will certainly do, we're here to talk about uh, all the interesting and fascinating objects of literature, art, and culture that are on display and, and so deftly analyzed in this book. Um, but before we go there, uh, and before we talk a little bit more about the argument you're making, which is in fact very intricate, um, I think it might be helpful for our listeners to have a broad definition of primitivism and a sense of how you understand the specificity of Jewish primitivism. Thank you, Leah. First of all, thank you to you and Benjamin for, for doing this, for talking to me about my book. Um, I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to a nice conversation. And thank you to the Levy Center for Jewish Studies and UCLA for, for having me. Um, in a kind of uh, virtual remote homecoming, my first job out of graduate school, a visiting assistant professor of Yiddish at UCLA. Um, and so it's, it's nice to be back in a way. Um, so yeah, before we figure out what, what Jewish primitivism is, we need to know what primitivism is. I'll, I'll bracket the question of what Jewish is, because of course that's woven throughout. Um, and if, if we foreground that, we'll never actually get to the book. Um, and what I'm going to do, I hope it's okay, is just kind of um, read a little bit to make sure I get all my points in. And then, of course, you know, we'll, we'll have a freer conversation. Um, okay. So I'll start off with two examples of Jewish primitivism. The first comes from the, uh, the great Yiddish writer, Yod Lamed Peretz, Y.L. Peretz, who said in a 1910 speech, quote, two paths lie before us. One path to Europe where Jewish form will be destroyed, the second path back. So by Jewish form, Peretz meant distinctly recognizably Jewish art, literature, culture. That was his subject. But where was back? So he answered it as follows. He said, the Bible, Hasidic, and folklorism. So these are kind of strange uh, grammatical parts of speech, and we can talk about that. But for the time being, these are sort of the targets. Forward and backward weren't his only directions. He also went up and down. Another quotation, quote, art is a staircase and the ground floor is the primitive of the folk. Mm -hmm. So his compass of Jewish art pointed 
back to the folk and down to the primitive. These are kind of the cardinal points of Jewish primitivism. Mm -hmm. Here's another example, um, a little less clear, a little more complicated uh, and, and, and provocative from Franz Kafka, the, the, German, uh, the Czech German language Jewish writer. He said in a 1912 speech, a kind of introduction to a performance of Yiddish poetry by an actor, he said as follows, quote, once Yiddish has taken hold of you and moved you, and Yiddish is everything, the words, the Hasidic melody, you will have forgotten your former reserve. Then you will come to feel the true unity of Yiddish. Another quote from 1914, this is what he wrote in his diary. Quote, what do I have in common with Jews? I have hardly anything in common with myself. I should stand quietly in a corner, happy that I can breathe, end quote. And then in 1915, the next year, after visiting a Hasidic gathering in Prague, he commented to his, to his friends, quote, looked at precisely, it was something like a savage African tribe. So in the first statement, Kafka sees Yiddish and Eastern European Jewish culture as an exciting repudiation of the westernized Judaism that he experienced growing up in Prague. In the next quotation, he rejects the premise of a kind of exoticizing gaze and turns the lens on himself. Forget comparing myself to other people, my problem is me. <laughs> Relative to the distance he feels from himself, the primitiveness of the Hasidim that he, he would, you know, in the next quotation compared to Africans is beside the point. But then of course, in the next quotation a year later, he does that. So where does he stand? And my answer is all of these together. Taking all of these examples together, we can start seeing the contours of Jewish primitivism. How are they primitivism? They participate in the same agenda as primitivism across European modernism and extending uh, far back before modernism in, in European thought and literature, really to classical antiquity. The belief that a better way of making art and a better way of living were found among people considered by Europeans to lack civilization. The idea was that before humans were corrupted by modernity, before they were corrupted by any civilization at all, that was when they were truly free, truly creative, truly alive. So for civilized, and that in the context of turn of the century European thought, civilized meant distinctly white Christian European. For civilized peoples, this time of freedom, creativity, and vitality, it ended before recorded history. But by the turn of the 20th century, because of the discovery of so-called primitive peoples in the wake of colonial uh, expansion, and a European science and ethnography following, um, European ethnographers and artists believed that such a state could still be found among so-called primitives who lived in a permanent state of prehistory. And this belief became an enormously powerful impetus for writers and artists from the end of the 19th century. Most famously, uh, Paul Gauguin and Pablo Picasso in the field of, of painting. Um, where primitivism was first defined as both a category of aesthetics and also an impulse to, to craft a cultural project. Gauguin, uh, who arguably, and I'm conscious that Benjamin is an art historian, so you know he can maybe quibble with the, the historiography, but arguably Gauguin was the first artist of modern primitivism. Gauguin wrote that in order to produce the kind of art he admired, he needed to, quote, become savage in spite of myself. And this was the goal of most European primitivism, but Jewish primitivism asserted a savage identity for Jews, not in spite of themselves, but because of it. So Jewish primitivism should have been impossible. European Jews were often stereotyped by themselves and by others as too modern, too urban, too political, too literate. And even if Hasidic or other Eastern European Jews did superficially resemble more distant so-called primitives, why would European Jews valorize a people actually among the most vulnerable in Europe? After all, neither Jews nor so-called primitive peoples, colonial subjects had a place as equals in modern civilized Europe. And Jewish primitivism were certainly not arguing for exclusion or subjugation. In imagining European Jews themselves as primitive savages, these writers and artists were blurring the border between savage and civilized. In other words, while primitivism was grounded in difference, Jewish primitivism took apart that difference because from the perspective of European culture, Jews were plausibly primitive, but also plausibly European. 
The result was a discourse that recognized its own impossibility. It was a powerful critique of the necessity of Jewish inclusion that began from the premise of inclusion. And finally, I'd just like to emphasize, and I, I hope that this will come out in our conversation, that Jewish primitivism was not uh, an artistic movement. It had no specific agenda or style. It was a series of impulses. It was a broader cultural project that emerged from these sort of uh, boundaries, from the boundaries conceptualized and articulated in European primitivism more broadly. And it worked in two broad areas that of course overlapped in terms of identity, social identity, um, and in terms of art and aesthetics. And I think I'll stop there. Sure, thank you for that overview. And I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you both and congrats on a wonderful book. Um, I would love to start by thinking about some of the challenges and opportunities of writing and speaking about primitivism. So as you've just laid out, there is kind of this broader sense of primitivism that um, includes looking back to antiquity, for instance. But then when we think about modernist primitivism, um, the links to colonialism and imperialism are very important. And um, historiographically, it feels like there was this moment in the 80s and 90s of critically analyzing that, especially in response to this MoMA exhibition that looked at affinities between modern art and African art. Um, but it feels like this debate is not over. Um, so it would be great to hear from you about what is at stake in revisiting primitivism and how your work on Jewish primitivism opens up possibilities for thinking about primitivism more broadly. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, you know, that, that's a, a huge question. So I'm gonna hope to tackle at least a part of it. Um, you're absolutely right that in the 1980s and into the 90s, there was a, a sort of scholarly reconsideration of primitivism. And the story of primitivism as a sort of category or moment in art history is itself really interesting. It was codified quite early by Robert Goldwater, an art historian, I think in his, in his book on modernist primitivism from 1927 or 28. Um, and, and he, you know, it was a brilliant book and he kind of nailed it. And, and that was it for a while, um, for a long time. Until, until the 1980s, when there was a debate trying to pry apart the, the claims of primitivism um, in terms of the way that European art sort of took for itself, appropriated really uh, African art, primarily at least that, as that famous MoMA exhibition um, presented it, but also art of the, of the Pacific uh, Islanders and, and so on. Um, and to try to understand whether there really was any kind of um, reciprocity, what that would consist of, um, and to try to understand the ramifications of the appropriation of other artistic traditions by European art and the degree to which that was recognized by the scholarship. And so that was obviously a, a, you know, a, an important debate to have. But interestingly, you, know, you said that, that the debate continued uh, I don't think the debate continued. I think the questions remained open, but I think actually, at least in art history, the debate kind of stopped there, um, at least in, in terms of um, the degree to which it, it remained uh, an actively debated question. Um, nothing really was resolved, but it was set aside. Why it was set aside, I don't know. You know I'm not an art historian. I'm, I'm coming at this a little bit from the outside. Um, but I, I think that in, in so, so that account of, of art history and then the critique of primitivism from within art history left out uh, some important things from the story. And two of the things that I noticed as I was beginning researching and writing this book were it left out literature and it left out um, a lot of Jewish literature and visual art that seemed to me to be um, really very much in the center of what's being described. But if you look at, at art historical treatments of European primitivism, German expressionism, and so on, you really don't see anything about Jewish visual art. Um, and you don't see anything about literature. You could say, well, it's art history. Why do you need to talk about literature? Um, but it became clear to me that not only were we talking about something that expands uh, beyond languages and across Europe, um, it also expanded uh, and extended across, across media, photography, 
painting, sculpture, other types of graphic art, and various forms of, of literature. Um, and also, crucially, it extended across colonial contexts. And this was another important part of the story that was left out because as it turns out, there's been some interesting recent work, for example, uh, another book published by Stanford uh, a couple of years ago, Literary Primitivism by Ben Etherington, where he talks mm -hmm. about, for example, Claude McKay and Aimé Césaire um, mm -hmm. in terms of primitivism. And this opened up or, or addressed really an important um, question or, or oversight really in the scholarship, which was that colonial subjects or people in the position of colonial subjects, um, like the Jamaican born Claude McKay, you know, a, a, a central figure of the Harlem Renaissance, couldn't be doing primitivism because primitivism was something that the hegemonic powers did. Right. And so um, in the context of French Caribbean literature, in the context of the Harlem Renaissance, in the context of um, so many literatures and 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 um, visual artistic traditions uh, along the peripheries, if you will, of European empire, these stories get left out. And mm -hmm. I found a story that was left out in the center of European empire from the from the cities at its heart. And that was the story of Jewish primitivism. And so I feel that um, Jewish primitivism is very much part and parcel of the current scholarly um, reconsideration of the story of primitivism as something much broader than, mm -hmm. than had been accepted. Um, and also because it is, you know, it's in Berlin, it's in Paris, although I don't, I don't quite get to Paris. Um, because it's in these places in the heart of continental Europe, of course, it starts pushing on the, the alignment of these conceptual categories with political borders. Absolutely. Um, maybe before we delve into some of these geographies that you're pointing to, media that you're pointing to, um, just want to ask one, hopefully, quick question about um, what it means to be vying with primitivism now as a scholarly project. I think one thing that we might be able to attribute that the pause in the debate or the impasse could be to this dilemma that primitivism specifically raises of trying to analyze it as a historical phenomenon while also separating oneself from uh, the judgments that are uh, in a part of primitivist discourse, even if those were meant as positive at the time. So we find ourselves using the square scare quotes and saying so-called a lot. So just wondering how you navigate this and then we can delve into some of the specifics of the book. Look, it's it's hard and it's a problem. I mean, you know, you did doing scare quotes the whole time and, and everybody who writes about primitivism needs to have, um, you know, some disclaimer up front or in the footnotes uh, to make clear that like, I don't agree with this. Um, much of it is bad. Most of it is racist. Um, another complicated aspect in the Jewish context is, and I found this early on present talking about my project with people, the immediate response is, oh, this must be anti-Semitic, mm. which makes sense in a way. Um, but of course, what's interesting about this and what makes it easy to overlook in the Jewish context, as well as e easy to overlook, for example, in the Harlem Renaissance is that, it's not anti-Semitic, it's not racist, um, depending on how it's being done and to what end. And even then, right, it might still be racist and it might still be anti-Semitic, but not in the way that we presupposed. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are these kinds of reverberating positive and negative um, valences that emerge from the, the sources themselves and then we have to, like you say, carefully separate ourselves out from that and, and find a way to talk about it without accidentally or, you know, hopefully not purposely um, recuperating um, some of those negative or really positive valences, right? The, the point here is to, at least for me, was to analyze these works within the context um, in which they were generated and to take their arguments um, and the sort of aesthetic work they did mm -hmm. on their own terms. So that's not to sort of disclaim the political resonances that, um, that primitivism more broadly or the Jewish primitivism continues to have. Those are obviously very important. But that the first step, and I was doing a first step in my book, the first step needs to be to try to stick as close as possible 
to mm-hmm. what the writers and artists are doing in these texts and these images. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wanted to circle back to a word you used a couple of times in your sort of opening remarks about primitivism more broadly, and that's the word appropriation. Um, and I'm partly fixating on this because appropriation is such a such a buzzword in, in, in today's culture and so, so loaded um, politically in so many ways. But I guess I wanted to think about the, or ask you to think out loud with us about the complexity of the, the type of appropriation we would be talking about in the context of Jewish primitivism. Um, and I also, as the kind of sort of mini sidebar inserted in this question, I was fascinated by what you just said about um, people like Claude McKay and Aimé Césaire. Um, Black Caribbean men, intellectuals, writers, artists, who um, I suppose technically couldn't do primitivism because they were not white European men. And yet, how much does a figure like, I'll talk about Aimé Césaire because I know his work better, how much does a figure like that trouble uh, the, the, the concept of what is a European man, a white man, how we code all of these things? I mean, Césaire being, of course, born in Martinique, which was a French colony and is now a French department, i.e. part of France, um, somebody who certainly born in a certain type of context, economically born into a certain rach- racial matrix, but schooled in France, um, schooled at the, uh, the, the the big normal school in Paris. So one of the first, um, one of the first colonial subjects which is code for one of the first black men to attend that school um, whose native language was French um, and who was a French citizen by virtue of his, of his particular colonial context. So I wanted to kind of also complicate that question of appropriation and sort of auto appropriation, if that's the word we want to talk about for these European Jews and, and think about how this all kind of tracks in, in your project. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, so the question of appropriation is, is obviously very complicated. And in terms of, you know, Pablo Picasso described the moment where he sort of discovered um, the importance or the, the centrality of, of primitive art um, as a visit to, to the ethnographic museum, the Trocadero in Paris. And museums like the Trocadero in Paris were, were filled with um, objects that had been um, expropriated, stolen, purchased for you know, unreasonably small sums and, and brought to Europe. So there, there's you know, an actual moment of appropriation of property. Right. Um, and from that, that moment of theft um, mm-hmm. emerged the various consequent levels of, of appropriation. In the Jewish context, it's a little bit different mm-hmm. um, because the sources themselves are, are so mediated um, in terms of the way that they come into modern Jewish culture and, and the way they're discovered by these artists. So first of all, I think it's important to say that, and this is one of the reasons why in my book, I talk about literature and art. I think that literature is maybe even the primary venue or medium of Jewish primitivism. Um, whereas the primary venue of, of non-Jewish, if you can say that, European primitivism, um, even if you know we begin carefully including um, Black writers uh, born in the Caribbean, um, is probably still painting. There was just a lot of it. Um, and the sources of literature, and this is another sort of complicated story. Why, why was primitivism so prominent in painting and not in literature? Well, one of the reasons is because um, you can just like Picasso walk into a museum, look at the object. You don't understand anything about it. You don't know what it is, where it's from, but you can make a drawing of it and copy it and, and be inspired. Um, you can't do that with folklore, with oral literature. Because if you're a European artist, you probably, you almost certainly do not know any of the languages that the, um, that the people telling the folklore, transmitting it, spoke. And if you're encountering it in an anthology translated into French or German, and there were plenty of those, right, it's been translated, maybe translated one or two times because the ethnographer copied it down, maybe the ethnographer didn't quite understand it well, published it in a scholarly document, and then some poet kind of... Um, translated it into into poetic or literary language. Um, So there's a tremendous linguistic hurdle. That linguistic hurdle does not exist to a great extent in the Jewish context because the folk language is Yiddish, the language of folklore is Yiddish, and the primary language of 
most uh, Eastern European Jews was Yiddish. Mm -hmm. um, so they already know the language. Mm -hmm. But there's still the, the question of what constitutes folklore. And so my book begins uh, talking about Peretz, who is you know, a, a writer, but also one of the most important theorists of folklore, not really from an ethnographic perspective, um, but from the perspective of somebody trying to generate in the moment, the question of what is Jewish culture? And as he's doing it, there's you know, hot debates going on about is the language of Jewish culture, should it be Hebrew or should it be Yiddish? Um, if it's Hebrew, what constitutes folklore? Well, the Bible. Um, but if it's Yiddish, and, and Peretz wrote primarily in Yiddish, then what constitutes folklore? And that's where he says, oh, that needs to be Hasidic literature. But Hasidic literature doesn't go all that far back, right? The first Hasidic um, um, collections of stories were published only in the second decade of the 19th century. Um, and Hasidism as a movement began in the 18th century, right? Well, well within the sort of recorded terrain of modern European um, culture and history. So it's not like this hazy uh, mythic moment where people create, you know, folk tales or fairy tales. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's part of recorded modern history and it needs to be turned into folklore and then taken as an object of primitivism. So there's already so many layers of mediation in the Jewish context, which I think just serves to show how strong the need was to find that primitive source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really rich. It is really rich. I'm wondering um, then based on this, um, the idea of uh, folklore and what, be what becomes folklore, the role of collecting literature, um, one of the ways you distinguish Jewish primitivism from primi primitivism is this idea of um, not being in spite of ourselves, but because of ourselves, this relation to Jewish experience in um, Europe. I'm also wondering if you could maybe talk about Jewish primitivism in the context of the development of modern Jewish studies and history in which ethnography played such a role and there were these efforts to go out and collect um, literature. So in some ways, it seems like that uh, context is also a way to uh, help us understand the contours of Jewish primitivism. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think in the, in the broader history of primitivism, ethnography is crucial. Um, salvage ethnography, the idea that ethnography must be done as a scientific discipline to preserve these, these, um, these, um, cultural expressions before they disappear, right? Also, you know, lamentably, tragically, with no consideration for the people who might disappear in these processes. Um, but also in the Jewish context, ethnography is, is intricately and intrinsically bound up with it. Um, the, the Zomlers, the collectors that you were referring to um, of, of at sort of, um, sponsored by Evo, the, the first uh, scientific uh, research institute that, that was based in and on Yiddish, um, promoted this kind of collection, this sort of auto-ethnography or self-ethnography, um, and, and is a, you know, part of the origin story of Yiddish studies as a modern academic discipline. It's also, and you know, maybe people will be mad at me for saying it, it was also kind of primitivist. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there, there's, there's, there's no denying it, at least from my perspective. And that's revealed in the fact that um, so many of the promoters of collecting, of identifying, assessing, and collecting um, culture, Yiddish culture, Ashkenazic uh, folklore uh, and folk art were the creators, the writers um, who produced the stuff that I talk about, parents. Ansky, very famously, Ansky wrote the Dybbuk, you know, perhaps the most, um, one of the, the most, the best known um, examples of Jewish primitivism, widely mm -hmm. translated, still performed, still something that people, you know, sort of uh, much more broadly are familiar with. Ansky was also, is also commonly identified as uh, the founder of Jewish ethnography. Mm -hmm. He organized uh, the, the, uh, an ethnographic expedition, composed uh, or, or co-wrote 
an ethnographic questionnaire that was very much in keeping with current ethnographic science at the same time as he was producing works that are, you know, tremendously, um, you know, to say it bluntly, primitivist. So, <laughs> so, so that sort of relationship isn't just kind of in the background as a very complicated set of historical intersections, but is actually in the primary figures of Jewish primitivism, doing yeah. Jewish ethnography, doing Jewish cultural production as part of a primitivist project. Yes, speaking of, I, I wanted to pivot to Kafka. Um, the ethnography um, realm provides a, a pretty a pretty straightforward, well, I don't know if it's pretty straightforward, but I think we can um, expose how straightforward that, that bridge might be. But I had wanted to think about Kafka out loud with you more generally, because I think in, in so many ways, um, Kafka is sort of the mainstay of this study, right? And it's his observation about the Hasidic Jewish um, gathering in Prague, where he says it was something like a savage African tribe that provides the opening anecdote for the book. And the quip becomes a kind of leitmotif for the book, if, if you'll permit that reading. I mean, you sort of circle back to that at, at different times to use it different ways. Um, and so what, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about Kafka is because I think amongst the various authors in your study, he's possibly the, one of the best recognized names. Um, but you open up his work in ways that I think would be surprising to, to lots, of, lots of Kafka readers. Um, so I have, a, I have a number of questions, but I wanted, I wanted to, again, sort of make this bridge to the, the ethnography question. Um, and, and I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about, um, towards the end of the Kafka chapter, um, you talk about this absolutely fascinating short story. Um, titled Ein Bericht für eine Akademie, um, a, a report on, on a, uh, for Academy or on Academy. And it has a very, this report has a very interesting protagonist named Rod Peter, Red Peter. Um, and once you tell us about it, uh, as soon as you start explaining who this protagonist is, I think our listeners are going to ask what Jews have to do with all of this. And this gets into the question of ethnography versus autoethnography as well. Um, so I was wondering if you just give us a, a synopsis of this story and how it, how it works for your, for your argument. Absolutely. Um, it's an amazing story and everybody should read it. It's been translated a number of times, usually I think with the title, uh, Report to an Academy. Um, mm -hmm. right. But, but before I tell you about, about that story, I think I want to take uh, two steps back because the, in the chapter, I actually, before I get to the literary works, the published literary works, I, um, I, I talk about Kafka's diaries um, and some other moments from, from other non sort of literary um, areas of his output. And Kafka for, in, in his own, um, in his own exploration of himself and of Jewishness, the access point to Jewish primitivism for him, um, and in many respects to, to knowledge about Judaism and Jewish culture more broadly. Judaism and Jewish culture more broadly, he gets a lot from books, um, but he, he travels a little bit. Um, and Kafka wasn't an extensive traveler, uh, and, and scholars have talked about the way that much of his, his travels were kind of interior travels. But he did a little bit of, of minor traveling. He went to a spa town where there were a lot of Hasidic Rebbe's, and he records his observations of them. Um, he goes with his friends in Prague to visit a Hasidic Rebbe who had escaped from the Eastern Front during the First World War and, and had set up in, in Prague. He goes to observe them. So ethnography doesn't only have to be done, you know, thousands of miles away. And Kafka is doing it on a small scale in the context of travel. And travel literature actually uh, plays an important part in the book. Um, the second chapter of my book is, is about some fascinating travelogues by Anski, who wrote the Dybbuk, and by the German Jewish authors Dublin and uh, Alfred Dublin and Josef Roth. But Kafka never wrote a travelogue, but he did these little bits of, of travel um, where he engages specifically with um, Jewishness, Hasidim. He describes them in exoticizing ways. He tries to figure out what it's all about. None of that appears in his literary works. The example that I end with in my chapter, uh, a report to an academy, um, is not about a Jew. It's not even about a human being at all. It's about an ape, an ape called Red Peter. This ape um, is captured not by an ethnographic expedition, but by something even more interesting. So Kafka very famously refrains almost entirely in his published works from any kind of um, 
historical specificity. One exception appears in this story uh, where he refers to the expedition that captured Rod Peter as being an expedition of Hagenbeck, who was a historical figure um, who went on to create uh, ethnographic showcases, these human zoos, as it were, that were enormously popular throughout Europe in the late 19th and well into the 20th century, um, where they would pay very little to um, indigenous peoples from around the world and put them on display for paying customers in European cities to come and gawk and, and look at them just sitting around. And also they, were, you know, they would be um, uh, asked to do various performances um, of one kind or another. So the ethnographic showcase was something that was in a way invented by this guy Hagenbeck. Hagenbeck started his career before he was kind of trafficking um, in the bodies and the culture of indigenous peoples from around the world. He trafficked in exotic animals mm. for sale in the European market. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that moment, uh, just with that one name that Kafka unfolds there by pointing to this ape called uh, Rotpeter, Red Peter, who's captured by Hagenbeck, brought to Europe. Rot Rotpeter decides he wants to find a way out, as he says, and become, become a man, become a person. Uh, and he seems to do it. He, he learns how to behave like a person. He learns how to speak to the point that the premise of the story is a uh, self-narrated uh, report by Rotpeter about his journey from ape to whatever he is now before some kind of scientific academy and it's never specified. Mm. And it's amazing. It's this, this deeply ironic moment, like what is going on here? Um, it seemed, you know, like an academic conference, right? We, we as academics um, perhaps learned later that anybody looking in from the outside that it's a bit of a zoo and a bit of a performance, but the racialized overtones in the context of Kafka's story um, mm -hmm. and the history of animal trafficking and human trafficking and culture trafficking behind mm -hmm. it um, mm -hmm. renders it you know, much more um, ironic, much more critical. And mm -hmm. Rodpeter is up there what has he become? Because he's still an ape, but of course there's no such thing as an ape that, that, that can give a lecture. Right. Um, so, so what is he? All of a sudden his identity no longer makes any sense. Of course he's not Jewish. Um, and Sandra Gilman most notably, but others have you know, tried to, to triangulate this, this story with um, interpretations of Kafka's approach to Judaism. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I'm not trying to argue that, you know, there's some key in the story, like the mention of Hagenbeck, that allows us to see this as being a reflection uh, on Jewish identity or an example of Jewish primitivism. But the analogy is that, uh, you know, as, as I say in the book, that the ape is Jewish because his experience is Jewish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, and I think this is an important point about Jewish primitivism, really Jewish culture in, in European modernity uh, more broadly, that it's not about finding an essentialized definition of Jewish identity, mm -hmm. um, because that never worked, never will work, doesn't work. Um, the definitions uh, are generated and fall apart uh, in all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. But it's about finding a pattern, a pattern of experience, uh, a pattern of, of discourses, a pattern of, of self-reflection and self-expression mm -hmm. that is so remarkably similar to the, the Jewish context and the questions generated by what was called you know, in, in German cultural criticism at the time, the Judenfrage, the question of Jews, where do Jews fit in European modernity, right? And Kafka is asking in this story, where does an ape fit in human modernity? Right, right, right. right. Um, one quick question for clarification, the, the historical figure Hagenbeck, was he Jewish? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, interesting. German non, not Jewish. Okay, that's what I figured. Interesting. Yeah. Um, another sort of towards the end of the Kafka chapter, another sort of moment that I thought was was um, was would be really interesting to to visit in this context is um, well, what I would would call what seems to be Kafka's obsession with with Indians, Native Americans. Um, you mention uh, an essay or story. Um, which is called the wish to be an Indian. It's interesting in German, it's Wunsch Indianer zu werden, so to become an Indian, right? Which is kind of an interesting nuance that's not captured in the English. Um, uh, 
it, maybe I could read the, the Kafka citation very quickly, and then I'd like to read your summation, if you don't mind. So in The Wish to Be an Indian, which, uh, which was published by Kafka in 1912, um, he writes, Oh, to be a red Indian, ready in an instant, riding a swift horse, a slant in the air, thundering again and again over the thundering earth until you let the spurs go, for there weren't any spurs until you cast off the reins, for there weren't any reins, and you scarcely saw the land ahead of you as close-cropped scrub, being already without horse's neck and horse's head. It's really sort of a tremendous image. And you follow up with this, which I think is also a tremendous image. So this is, I'm quoting Spinner here, to ride like the wind with no reins, no spurs, and even no horse. In other words, to be free. Kafka's Jewish primitivism did not seek to replace the bourgeois Jewishness of his upbringing with something more authentic, but it was also not a critique of the project of seeking and crafting alternative Jewish identities. It was rather an attempt to be free of the entire problem of identity, free of the anxieties and challenges of being Jewish, perhaps even of being human. And I thought this was an incredible gesture to make on your part. In a way, it almost feels like, I mean, obviously the book can't end here, but there's something really interesting about this notion of um, thinking through all these questions of what Jewish identity is, what identity is, what it, what the question of the primitivism of primitivism has to do with all of that, and then to identify Kafka as actually being interested in unfettering himself from all of this. Um, for me, as somebody who works on post-colonial francophone texts, it's also a really interesting um, thought that maybe what some of these writers who have been so associated with the minor, minor literature, et cetera, et cetera, maybe, maybe what they want most of all is to not have to deal with these questions, right? To not have the question of identity constantly be, be put on the table. Yeah, thank you for, and so what, what Leah read, that was the entirety of the Kafka text. Um, that's the whole story and it's a remarkable story. And uh -huh. um, oh, so uh, when you say the short text, it really is just that? It's just that. Um, it's like from a, a collection called Betrachtungen and Observations and, and that was it. Um, and it's this remarkable moment. Um, and, and, you know, Leah read my, my interpretation and that really captures it. Yeah. Um, it's, and, and you find this throughout Kafka and really throughout um, so many of the writers and artists that I talk about, there's, there's an anguish there. Um, and I think it's related, as you say, to the anguish of, um, you know, uh, of somebody working, laboring beneath the expectations of coloniality that never disappear within the context of, of the post-colonial situation. Um, you know, constantly needing to position oneself. Where exactly do you stand, right? And, and, you know, trying to describe who Kafka is the way, you know, French writer Balzac, right? So do that for Kafka. It's impossible. Czech, right, right. Czech Jewish, German Jewish, Czech, German Jewish. Right. You know, how do you do that? Um, and, and Kafka was, you know, so... Um, sensitively attuned to these broader problems and to the way they reverberated within himself. And in this moment, you just get this, this idea that, that starts at this point of exoticization that has a lot in common with um, a sort of broader racist exoticization of Native Americans and German culture mm -hmm. in that period. Mm -hmm. And so it's still anchored in that, but moves so swiftly into, into this, this, sort of remarkable moment of freedom mm -hmm. where not only does the rider feel free, mm -hmm. right? But the horse seems to just disappear and the rider himself seems to disappear. Right, um, right. And, and everything goes away. There's no solving the problem without, without taking everything away. Mm, yeah, that's right. There's a lot to be said about the, um, both in Germany and in France, at least this obsession with the American Indian figure, um, which we find in lots of different uh, texts and, and cultural works. Um, but for another time, I think um, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, aesthetics um, and I'll hand it to Ben for, for this. Sure, there seems to be a pivot point here a little bit in the sense that um, the way you're articulating how um, uses of primitivism really applied to this um, like larger critique of identity. And that's such a through line of the way you treat the aesthetics of Der Nister, especially. Um, and although it comes up in that chapter, I think we can think about uh, how primitivism 
uh, lays the groundwork for these other forms of subjectivity um, that are being worked out aesthetically. Um, so I understand you have, you wanted to discuss an image from the text. And I, I think it's, it's one where uh, these kinds of new formations of subjectivity are, are quite clear. So thank you. So this, this picture here is by uh, Elze Lasker Schuler, a German Jewish um, writer and artist. She was best known in, in her time and now as a writer, as a poet, um, really a, a prolific and a beautiful poet who has regrettably been translated only in a very limited way um, into English. There are a couple of new translations of her prose works into English that are definitely worth checking out. Um, and she interwove images into her works um, and in a way very sort of uh, expressive of the European avant-garde, she interwove her aesthetic project into her life. Um, mm -hmm. She, her, her name was Elsa Lasker Schuler, um, but she, she famously wrote in a little bio that although she was born in Elberfeld in the Rhineland, um, she came to this world in ancient Thebes, Egypt. And she developed a, a series of personas, uh, the most uh, prominent one, what we see here called Prince Yusuf, who appears in literary works, in her correspondence. She insisted that people refer to her like on the street or in the cafe as Prince Yusuf. Um, Prince Yusuf was her. She would appear in this kind of elaborate um, fantasy version of, you know, quote unquote, oriental costume, um, somewhat similar to what's depicted here. And Prince Yusuf, this, this Egyptian prince who was also her, um, was also the head of what she called the Bund der Wilden Juden, the Society of Savage Jews. And the Society of Savage Jews appears, and this is what one of my chapters is about, appears in various places throughout her work, including in this um, beautiful image um, drawn and colored by Lasker Schuler herself. And in the bottom left, uh, she writes, this is the Der Bund der Wilden Juden, the Society of Savage Jews. And we see a group here kind of maybe dancing or, or uh, moving slowly in a circle with their arms around each other, Bund, cognate with English bond, right? They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're bonded together in a society um, in a kind of loving embrace. Um, the, the visual elements you can see are orientalizing, exoticizing. Mm -hmm. There's a blue star of David above mm -hmm. signaling some kind of Jewish affiliation here. Mm -hmm. And extremely fascinating and important for the argument that I make in the chapter is that on Yusuf's waist uh, and gripped by one of his hands is a scabbard of a dagger or a sword. And written on the scabbard and on the handle is the Hebrew word ve'ahavta, mm -hmm. and thou shalt love. Mm -hmm. From the two biblical passages, uh, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, you know, sorry, two passages that resonate in, in Jewish um, tradition in the biblical passage, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's written on a, on a sword, right? Thou shalt love right, right. on the scabbard of a sword. What, what is, you know, what, what is the sword for then? Right. Um, and that sort of pulsating, strange presence of violence um, throughout the oeuvre of a person who by all accounts was extremely nonviolent, um, was very much the bohemian artist um, and famously called herself unpolitical. Um, which, of course, was a mystification on her part of clear political affiliations and engagements. Um, but this, this moment of, or this, this capacity for violence mm -hmm. um, then gets picked up by uh, somebody she met in Berlin in the early 20s, Uri Tzvi Greenberg, who became one of the great Hebrew language Israeli poets mm -hmm. of the 20th century, um, but at that time was still writing in Yiddish. Uh, expressionist poetry. And in his early Hebrew works, he takes the Bund der Wilden Juden and he translates it into Hebrew, literally, Brit HaYehudim HaPraim, Brit Covenant Society of Savage Jews. Mm -hmm. um, and that moment of violence then 
still not explicitly, but much closer to the surface, percolates through his works. And his politicization is explicit. He articulates it clearly. It's Zionism, it's far right wing Zionism um, with the clear direct purpose of using poetry to be a, a part and parcel of the project to settle, um, to settle the land of Israel and, and make a nation state there. Um, so they have this strange relationship where they're obviously very different people and have different political trajectories. But at that moment of a sort of Jewish primitive identity that Lasker Schuler is playing with, Greenberg then extracts uh, a, a stark um, and a stark political vision that is oriented to, um, to a moment, an actual moment, their moment, um, whereas her articulation remained in the realm of cultural production and of fantasy. Right, right. I, I know ben, ben has a question he wants to jump in with. I just want to make a quick comment on this um, this image, which I found so powerful, especially in the context of your reading of, of Lasker Schuller's sort of this, this fantastic imaginary universe peopled with Arabs and the savage Arab Jews, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this, this argument you're making throughout the book about the, the fascination with the other and the projection onto the other is truly a fascination with the self and a kind of retrospective projection. And I, I sort of saw that embodied in this image in the, this tiny figure in the background. So you can just barely see the head and there's kind of like a headdress with a, well, it looks a little bit like a horn, but I imagine it's kind of an elaborate sort of um, protuberance coming, coming out of the top. And if you look at this image closely, that figure is not only sort of peeking up above the, the trio, but the, it seems to be seeking eye contact with the viewer. Uh, in other words, that, that, that figure seems to be looking right at the, the painting self. And so this kind of exchange of gazes between the self and the other, which might also be a kind of um, recursive gaze of the self onto the self seemed to me to be really emblematized in this tiny detail of this, this, fascinating, uh, this fascinating sketch. Um, so I just wanted to fit that in there. Um, but Ben, over to you. I know you have a question about art and, and text. Sure. No, that's actually um, great. I mean, one of the things swirling around in my head are um, theorizations that have been done on aesthetic subjectivity that really um, are uh, going up against ideas of the autonomous art object, the autonomous subject um, that were so like calcified in European modernity. Um, but so in that way, I think you're dealing with aesthetics is uh, it, it, I mean, it makes your argument incredibly rich. Um, but one of the other questions I had around it is that the you, you of course, are dealing with image and text, right? Primitivism as um, something that's not limited to a particular medium. We have, I mean, image and text quite literally in what we just saw, but we also have um, in your work, you engage our historical discourses to discuss literature, you talk about how um, you use primitivist art aesthetic theories to understand the literature of Der Nister. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can think, uh, reflect methodologically, perhaps on studying image um, and text and perhaps how um, this is, um, yeah, really offering something new um, in, to, uh, in the face of what's been a persistent feature of Western modernism. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a great question. Really important to the way I approach my work and, and hopefully to the, the way it came out. Um, but first, I want to say about, about Leah's comment uh, about that drawing. I had never noticed that. Um, and I've spent many hours looking at that drawing. So thank you for that. I think you're exactly right. And that like captures um, an extra extra layer to what's interesting there. Um, to return to, to your question, Benjamin, um, I think that you know, there are many and complicated reasons why literature is separate from art history in universities and, you know, flowing from that in, in everything that we do as scholars. Um, and one of the one of the downsides, you know, assuming that there are positives for those divisions, uh, one of the downsides is that it can prompt us to, to miss things. Um, including central things. Um, and so it's, it's no secret that in the European avant-garde, uh, the, the relation of word and image was, was crucial um, to uh, you know, aesthetic theorists, um, to people putting these theories into practice, um, especially in Dada, but, but really throughout. Um, 
And um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm not the first person to, to pay attention to the visuality of text and certainly not to the textuality of art. Um, but but there is a way I think that you know my my willingness the freedom that I took for myself to jump from a chapter about photography to a chapter about literary texts um, to do a reading of literary texts in light of contemporary visual theory um, does seem maybe a little bit um, I don't know maybe slightly unusual um and and what I was really doing was trying as much as I could to respond to the sources uh, and what's clear is that in the context there was relatively little regard um to to uh what to them would have seemed to be an arbitrary division between the literary and the you know the visual um for example artists, um, Jewish artists associated with Yiddish culture often talked about the Dybbuk, a play, as being you know, a primary inspiration for their art. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that work? What does that mean? Um, and you know, the chapter where, where this really comes into play methodologically for me is in my chapter on, on Der Nister. And you know, it's a long chapter, and there's a lot to say there, and, and, and we don't have so much time uh, left today. But very briefly, you know, I, I argue that Der Nister, who writes these short stories that are extremely weird and extremely complicated and challenging to figure out in a million different ways, um, what I argue is that one hopefully good way to figure out what he's doing is to put his works in conversation with um, the, the theorist Karl Einstein, a German Jewish art historian and theorist, who was one of the preeminent um, art theorists of his time uh, producing what's probably the first theory of primitivism um, as well as art historical treatment within Europe of African art. Mm -hmm. uh, also one of the first theorists of cubism and so on. He talked quite a lot about the relationship specifically in cubism of its theories within visual art of its transferability to literature. And he believed quite clearly, and you know, he articulated it, that it should be possible. He never pulled it off, which is something that, that he also acknowledged, because it's also kind of hard. How do you transfer visual principles to a literary text? So the ins and the outs of that I, I deal with in the chapter, but ultimately what I argue is that Dernister does this, that so many of the things that he does that seem inexplicable and very hard to understand from a literary perspective. For example, one 40 page story that has 1,200 instances of the word and, um, which were first counted by a, a Soviet Yiddish linguist who was trying to figure out what Dernister was doing. How can you write a story with so many and, so many conjunctions, parataxis going on and on and on, and, 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 in grammatically incomprehensible ways? Um, what does that mean? How does it work? Mm -hmm. Or a much later story that, that seems to reflect itself and invert itself um, and move in ways that are not organized by a sort of plot-based narratological principle, but by something that seems much more visual. Uh, what I'm arguing is that actually it is much more visual. These are visual theories that are being applied in a literary text. And it doesn't seem, you know, he's obviously trying to do something complicated, but he's also trying to do something that he didn't perceive as, as a limit or a transgression. Because the purpose here was to unearth the potentials that this theorist, Karl Einstein, had first identified in African sculpture. African sculpture, Einstein said, can... Uh, because of the way it reorganizes space and, re and forces the viewer to perceive in a different way, it then reorganizes the entire way you perceive your own subjectivity in the universe. So, you know, if you're a revolutionary like Karl Einstein was and like Der Nister was, that's a great thing. We should get all our art to do that. So how do you do it in literature? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I argue Der Nister was doing. Um, and for the ins and the outs of that, you can, you can see the chapter in my book. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's, a, it's a fantastic chapter. Um, so we, we do need to probably start wrapping up, but um, can't leave without uh, talking about some of the remarks in your conclusion. So as a sort of penultimate question, um, in the conclusion, you make it clear that Jewish primitive, primitivism really needs to be understood as this um, historical phenomenon, um, right? You talk about the limits of Jewish primitivism after the Holocaust, but you also talk about um, certain things we might see today, um, 
that uh, kind of might make us think <laughs> of Jewish primitivism. So uh, I would love to ask you about this current vogue for Yiddish, um, the kind of increasing academic capital that Yiddish has accrued, but also um, the, yes, the trendiness of Yiddish outside of the academy and how this relates to your book. Thanks. Um, you know, that, that's an important question. And, and I do spend a little bit of time in the conclusion talking about it, maybe not enough. There's a lot to be said. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's complicated. Um, and, and I think that I, I'd want to separate the question of, you know, as you put it, the, the increasing capital that Yiddish is accruing in the academy. Um, I don't know quite how to account for that, um, even as I, you know, hold a professorship in Yiddish. But you know, one important element, of course, is that these positions <laughs> are often endowed by individual philanthropists, and and mostly wouldn't exist if if the university's sort of economics were left up to itself. Um, so that's you know that's one aspect, a, a sort of thoughtful uh, philanthropy. Um, but there's still the aspect of, of why and how Yiddish is being welcomed into academic disciplines where, where it previously wasn't. Um, and then there's the, the area which is much more prevalent and much more, more prominent that you pointed to, which is the broader interest in Yiddish in, in the general public. And that's a really fascinating area. Um, and you know, speaking very, you know, painting with a, with a broad, broad brush, brush strokes, um, I think we can say that for a lot of people, Yiddish is a way of connecting to Jewishness um, without political baggage mm -hmm. or with a specific political, you know, set of political bags, um, identifying with revolutionary uh, Yiddish politics. Um, whichever sort of political stream or whichever desire, you know, to be free of Jewish religious identity or to connect to an earlier form of Jewish religious identity, right? You have all these flip sides of these coins. Both sides of the coins are happening in, in all of these cases. Uh, what ties it together is a desire for some kind of core sense of, of authenticity, mm -hmm. that, that Yiddish is a conduit to a kind of Jewishness that is more, more something. Um, and that, that desire for the more is essentially primitivist. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that much of the interest uh, that one might find um, among people cur con currently interested in Yiddish culture um, connects with these artists and writers who I've identified as, as Jewish primitivists because mm -hmm. the interests and the desires resonate. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, that's not to condemn people who are interested in the Dybbuk because they get excited about Jewish folk culture in the same way that Ansky did, not at all, but I think it's important to understand the historical origins and resonances of these things that might feel like new discoveries. And why do they feel like new discoveries? Well, obviously the Holocaust, right, created this, this, um, this enormous lacuna this huge open space that it feels like, you know, it's impossible to fill in. Mm -hmm. But even with the massive destruction of the Holocaust and the discontinuities, there are still profound continuities in Jewish culture. And I think we can understand a lot of what, what managed to survive and come over and through and despite the Holocaust mm -hmm. and understand the things that are being activated today in Yiddish culture, mm -hmm. if we can trace it back to that moment of Jewish primitivism. Mm -hmm. That seems like an apt place to leave our discussion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sam, for joining us to talk about your book. Thanks so much, Ben, for, for being a great co-panelist. Um, I encourage everybody again to, uh, to secure as soon as possible a copy of Jewish Primitivism, one of the few academic books without a subtitle, something to be thankful for, um, and enjoy. It's really a great read. You'll discover things you already, you'll discover things about writers you'd already heard of and many things that, uh, that, are, that will be revealed in the text. Thanks so much. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Benjamin. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Thank you both. I wish we had another hour. <laughs>